Yeah, um, teaching for, for, for me personally, teaching during the pandemic is actually not that different from how I've taught for, for years mm -hmm. around virtual collaboration and like distributed learning um, for quite some time. Um, and it wasn't that much of a change for me personally, to, to be quite honest. I think, I think uh, the first thing would be uh, just to be forgiving with yourself, because I think it's the kind of thing where you're used to a certain um, level of confidence and facility uh, working in person in a classroom, and you've been doing that for um, you know, a pretty good chunk of, of your life. And uh, as you enter a new environment, like adopting a, um, a spirit of like experimentation and combine that with a level of forgiveness for yourself too, where not everything is gonna work, some things are gonna be kind of awkward, um, but I think to a large extent, if you're trying and you're trying to do a good job, like students will see that. And um, I think people are more forgiving than you think that they would be. Uh, so I think the, the main thing is just to, um, as sort of step one is uh, go out and experiment and then be forgiving with yourself. Uh, I think with, <laughs> that's actually kind of a tougher one because you, you're kind of more subject to, um, uh, your, um, your environment with, with, uh, when, when you're in the position of being a student, I think if I were a student, I'd be thinking about like, um, how can I stretch the different ways in which I can interact with, uh, the class material and with my classmates. So mm -hmm. there are things like around, um, just have a spirit of, um, like experimentation and playfulness where you're like, and, and notice how you're feeling. Like, so if you're feeling, for example, if you're feeling like uh, bored or checked out, like challenge yourself to be like, okay, well, what's a way in which I can engage with this material um, in a way that is related to what's being talked about. So um, our natural instinct will be like, if we're getting bored with something, we'll check you know, social media, or we'll check like other things, not engaging you think about like, okay, well, if the subject is uh, um, ancient Egyptian history, um, and I'm having trouble, like kind of paying attention, like, what could I be uh, either, um, you know, chatting with my classmates, or uh, looking up on the internet, that's relevant to the topic at hand, and then like try to kind of engage with the material in a different way, but that's related to what's being talked about. Yeah, yeah you know, with, with, with relationship building, like um, what, um, like one thing that I do with, um, with our, like all of our students is we will have students do like introductions of themselves and just kind of talk what they're um, like in our opening credits for Reimagining Campus Life, for example, we'll, we'll roll together all the student introductions so people will talk about like, you know, um, their hometown and like maybe like one or two things about them. And then things that kind of plant like these nuggets of curiosity where you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I want to learn more about this part of Alana. You know, like she said, like she's, she likes um, um, flaky biscuits. I don't know, like, you know, like as, as a thing and just kind of surfacing these kind of random personal details that make people just kind of curious about each other. And so like a lot of relationship building is kind of just is more process of um, mutual noticing. Mm. And then um, for me as a, as a teacher, I want my students to know that like I'm interested in them. Like I don't like, they're not just like inputs coming into a factory and I have to change them and that's it. But like, I'm curious like what they're excited about. I'm curious about like their, their backstory. I'm curious about like what, they have planned and like why they care about those things. Um, having a, a stance of curiosity, I think is really important with building relationships with students. Uh, there, I mean, there's, there's so many, <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but, but I think, I think uh, as one, one thing to start, I think the level of, um, I think if we flip our mindset and think about it less as like, oh, you know, it's inherently worse or like there's a deficit that has to be made up. Um, the level at which people can engage and be connected with each other is actually a lot higher. So for example, like a lot of uh, what I lean on a lot is having students work in, in small groups, not just on project work, but even like in the context of class. 
So for example, I'll, I'll do, I do this thing where um, I'll sit students in pods, like on a digital whiteboard. And during uh, like a more kind of lecture oriented part of class, I will encourage them to like pass notes to each other in class. And then so that way they have like a conversation amongst like three people. They have like small conversations versus having like, you know, an 80 person chat thread, which is impossible to follow. Mm -hmm. But what are ways that we can kind of like segment things into like smaller uh, uh, pods of connections and kind of rotate around so different people talk to different people. But um, I think with what, what remote learning can help enable is actually more human connection, a wider swath of other classmates and get to know more people. And particularly for students who might be, you know, more introverted or more shy, you're providing like context for interaction. And that's something that they may not have gotten like in an in-person class. Like, I think using uh, digital whiteboards in general is good. Like I use uh, a tool called Mural and um, Mural also has like, uh, um, they make their, their uh, resources pretty broadly available to educa educators. Um, and there's, uh, in that same space, there's also a product called Miro. So there's Miro, M-U-R-A-L, and then Miro, M-I-R-O. Uh, they're both very like supportive of uh, like um, of educators and having like having a digital whiteboard and learning different ways in which you can use it um, is really critical because what happens then is students can kind of work on a problem in a way that's visible to everyone, mm -hmm. and so people can kind of look over at like what other people people are doing and kind of learn from each other in that kind of way. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is dependent on a lot of things. I think, I think the future, uh, one of the things I see in the future of remote learning is it, there are these tremendous opportunities to, to take the campus beyond campus. There's no reason why like, um, you know, students who are located in California can't be working together with students in Alabama at the same time, or for that matter, students in California collaborating with uh, students in Singapore, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, actually a lot of classes I've taught are kind of like along that vein where we, we work across borders and like being able to kind of uh, dig deeper into that and also take it uh, beyond uh, what I call taking it beyond the Zoom squares and making remote learning more three-dimensional and so people are able to get a sense of each other's three-dimensional space and um, get a sense of like each other's environments. I think that is also something that's going to be changing pretty rapidly around remote learning. I, well, I, ho I hope it will be. <laughs> um, and I'm developing material around how to help um, educators think about what I call distributed space. And then you're in, and in virtual space is like what's on a screen. But there's kind of this thing that kind of our collective spaces that, that like our collective physical spaces that we, we are connected through, through like a virtual interface um, that I think can really change the way that we, that we interact. Like, mm -hmm. so distributed space would be like, um, let me try to do a quick example here. So if I, um, so right now what you see is like, this kind of like flat screen, right? Like, right. Um, and then, but if I'm doing this, you don't really know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. But if I were like, oh, let me give you a little bit of a tour. And then what I'm really looking at is like outside the window. Uh huh. And then like, like, oh, wait, let me give you a, sorry, I'm gonna try to position my mic so you can hear me. Um, like here is, you know, here's like what I'm looking at here. And then, cool. and then when I look, look around, like here is, you know, what's behind me, you know, and then I eat stuff over there, uh -huh. you know, like, and what happens is, when we get a more three-dimensional sense of each other's space, we are able to um, uh, kind of develop more empathy and trust with each other because we kind of know like, it, it's kind of like um, when you talk to somebody on the phone, like if you talk to your, like, like your, your parents and you, and you know like where they're probably sitting, what they're looking at, and you kind of imagine them, right, where they are. And we, we don't really do that like with a lot of, we, or we haven't kind of like experimented with that as much with, with, with video. Um, and so what happens with some of my students is like, even though they've never met each other in person, they actually have a very good sense of each other 
and like each other's space and like oh this is what Melissa is like you know when she's in Albany and she's doing this and that um I think building on that kind of idea um I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities about um having that spatial awareness mm -hmm. and then also thinking less in terms of like okay we um you know we interact with like keyboards and mouses and stuff like that and instead of our our hand motions being like so small like thinking about like how can we activate uh people in like in a larger kind of more like full body kind of way with with uh with virtual learning i think i think there are things like where um i'll give an example like we use a lot of uh video messages when people do uh like when students share reflections and there's something about like the reflection process that's different when you're, I mean, it's great to like write things for sure. Like I'm not, I'm really not against writing. Um, but what's interesting about doing um, the example of doing like reflections in video messages is you get a sense of a person's emotional state mm. and you get a sense of like where they're very confident or where they're unsure, you know, where they're kind of worried. And like, there are things where, I actually understand the emotional state of my students better in a virtual environment than I do in person because I'm almost like forced to rely on these other things that, that, that give me like, um, kind of a, um, a deeper sense of where a student is at. I'm pretty actually not, I, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it quarantine sucks. Like, it's not like, it's not a good thing, but, um, I think for me, it's been pretty easy to, to adapt. Um, and it's been just like a time to, uh, because my, my experience and expertise is around distributed collaboration. It's just been a time where I felt, I've felt very like, um, I need to like help, help people. Like, I mean, I really, really need to help people now. Like, I mean, I've always wanted to help people, but like now is the time where I need to just like write more. I need to like talk to people more and just kind of get out there and like understand what struggles people are having and kind of help them experiment their way through to find like better ways of, of, of interacting, of collaborating, of creating together. Um, so it's been a time of, um, yeah, it's been like a, a time of like just kind of intense focus. Um, but then there's a part of me that's like, I really need a vacation. So. <laughs> I think, um, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm, I think I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of emerging from a period of like intense focus and kind of trying to look around more at what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So I'll be really interested to see like other uh, stories on life in, in uh, life in quarantine. Uh, because I just think there's, it's, it's a time where um, I think we're going to look back at 2020 and 2021 when a lot of things changed and the way that we interact changed and like people became more comfortable with um, interacting like virtually when it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it also be becoming more appreciative of the, the times that we do have in person together and like what, what kind of, what's unique about that as well. But I think it's, it's less about kind of good, bad and more about expanding like um, the different ways in which we can interact that, that, that can make sense. It's, I think that the challenge is like, it's, it's so, I think once we have the choice again, of being able to choose um, in person for certain things and virtual for other things, like having that element of choice will psychologically make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think some, if somebody says like, oh, then we're just going to go back to everything is going to be like the way it was before. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think it will be because now people see like, oh, for certain things, it makes more sense to do it like with a wider, paint with a wider palette, so to speak.